Hello, New York City. <laughs> Let's all try to act like a normal family, okay? Hey, man, everything I read? You know, maybe New York is not for you guys. Bravo! What are you doing? Closing the blinds. No one's watching. Oh, this guy is. An all-new season of The Detour premieres February 21st at 10 on TBS. Jason Jones, let's hear it! Let's go! Don't do that. No more times. I'm not deserving of that. I'm gonna make him do it again. I can make no. Him. They've do it again. Do They've oh, clapped no. enough. Thank you. I didn't actually think they'd listen to me. Jason, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. Oh, there we go. They do for me too. He got four claps when he went on. Four. Uh, that's the most we've ever had. That's a record. Sorry. Whoa. Should we? We've got 25 minutes. Should we just roll into this? <laughs> Let's just keep clapping for 25. Uh, congratulations, season two premieres Thank you. tonight. Yes, it does. On TBS. I can't wait. It's fantastic. You've seen it. I've seen the first two episodes, yes. Oh, great. Well, those are the ones that air tonight. Oh, fantastic. So you can take the night off. Right. I'll, be on, I'll be on duty next week. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, where did you want to go with the show in season two? Because season one, I mean, the, the title detour initially is like, okay, this family goes on a detour from their vacation or whatever, but the show itself goes on many detours and down many rabbit holes you would never expect this type of show to go on. It's almost like we thought about the title <laughs> before we gave it that title. It's almost like you're in a room going, so many layers, man. Uh-huh, yeah. It is not just a literal detour, but a, a, uh, a metaphorical and metaphysical detour. Uh, no, I, I never wanted to make a, you know, I, I think we got written off a little too early last year by some people saying, oh, this is, this is National Lampoon's Vacation the Series, which if you've seen the show, it is about as far from that as possible. Uh, we, yes, we are in a car the first season, but, uh, you know, we, in the first season, we uh, married, my wife becomes a minister out of spite to another reverend, and, uh, <laughs> and then she marries uh, a pedophile. <laughs> so it's not your family comedy. <laughs> I'll also say, uh, it's better than National Lampoon's Vacation. I think we have a lot of nostalgia for Vacation. I personally think it's a, somewhat of an overrated comedy. Uh, and I think the detour is, is better. You don't have to agree with it. Either. I can't agree with it, but thank you for saying it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a narcissistic asshole if I, <laughs> if I agree with that. I agree my show is better than an iconic movie of all time. So, Jason, uh, after taking, uh, I can't use the word fucking detour now, after going in so many different <laughs> directions, in the first season, uh, where did you guys start with the second season of this? Of this, and did you have already have anything mapped out going into the first season? Uh, yes, I'd thought about things. Uh, <laughs> Good for we, you. Uh, I think about things before I write them down on paper. Uh, I had, uh, I had, yes, I had uh, the, the 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 first season. You see uh, a tease of I'm being interrogated uh, at, at the beginning of each episode, which actually uh, is it serves as two purposes: is one thread, one narrative thread, but then also uh, acts as a recap from the previous season or for the previous episode. And then, so that uh, storyline plays into the body of this season. Uh, what you think I'm being interrogated for, it's not I'm being interrogated. So, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, sorry, should have, it's good. Uh, <laughs> is that is that I, I was not the one being interrogated. They, they were not after me, this federal agency. They were after my wife for uh, a multiple uh, person, not a personal person, as a multiple identities, fraudulent identities and fraudulent marriages. Uh, she had a really fucked up past. <laughs> Didn't tell me about it. We got married, and now this season is really unpacking that uh, that storyline. One of the things that I, uh, I love about the show is that you're you're a, a really funny person, not just as an actor, but as a general person, and your wife is as well. No. And you guys decided to make a show where you play a different kind of character. You don't play a comedian living in New York, struggling to get by or struggling to get a show on the air. I like that you chose to. You, you, you've you've had your fill of those type of shows. You fucking have, man. <laughs> I'm a stand-up, and they won't give me time on stage. <laughs> well, not just. Woe is me. I'm gonna eat a burger. <laughs> Great shows. <laughs> but no, the fact that you created a story and not just a, a, a sort of setup for doing each episode, you actually have a serialized story as well. Like you really cared about fleshing out characters and story. 
you're suggesting that I've put effort into my show. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for that. I have. No, I want. I, I'm also it, suggesting that all those shows about failed stand-up <laughs> put no effort into, it, which is not true. I feel bad now. Yeah, you should, and I'm sure you'll take some heat from it. I won't because I didn't say it. Uh, there is a. I uh, yes, there was no there was no serialized comedy out there really. Uh, so I sort of took advantage of that, and I, that was something I did want to tell. Why aren't people doing this? The, the greatest dramas that we watch, we watch because we want to see what happens next. So why not have that in a comedy? Why reset it every episode? You can reset it slightly, and I, I think ep you can, each episode does uh, hold on its own, but it works better in the, uh, in the full narrative arc. And in this season, you're in uh, New York. Talk about uh, bringing it there. And also talking about James Cromwell, who is the best. James Cromwell, him. yes, uh, known for many, many things. But we all know him from Babe, let's be honest. Uh, let me do make three Babe jokes <laughs> at his expense <laughs> this season. And, uh, and he went along uh, playing them. He called me. Uh, I offered him the part. And he called me. And uh, he'd watched the first season. And he went, hey, hey man, uh, crazy show. It's almost like. It's almost like you're on drugs while you're writing this. <laughs> like, that's like, it's Commedia dell'arte at its finest. <laughs> I was like, I think you're giving this too much credit, but yeah, thanks, man. And, uh, he, uh, I, and there was a long pause, and I went, I don't know what to say to this guy. But like, yeah, you, uh, I was just stuttering. And uh, he went, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> it was just like that. It was great. Uh, I didn't have to sell him, pitch him, and it was great. And uh, he's so good in the show. He's so terrific. And he, uh, he w will write stupid lines sometimes, and we know they're stupid lines. Like my father calls, uh, uh, he's a hoser from Canada, uh, he, <laughs> he calls uh, toilet paper shit tickets. And... We gave Wait, the, yeah, that is the best. We line. gave James Cromwell this line, where he's uh, he, he's he, uh, he rents out space to the IRS. He's, he's like the only person in New York that uh, the, where the IRS pays him money, and uh, he's very proud of that. And he charges them for bathroom uh, tissue. And the guy politely asks when he has to go to the bathroom, and he just takes up a piece of uh, toilet, or a, a roll of toilet paper, whips it at the guy's head, goes, "Those shit tickets are going on your bill." <laughs> It's a stupid line, but James Cromwell just gives it gravitas. It's a really funny line. I've yeah. never heard it referred to as shit tickets yeah. before, and I, I laugh hysterically. Now you will that. probably know. I was like, ah, oh, we're out of shit tickets. Damn and, it. and Cromwell <laughs> plays a kind of uh, libertarian, Ayn Randish businessman. I yes, imagine yes. he loves sinking his teeth into that, because I've talked to him before. He's a fairly politically minded person. He's sure very he political. We, we were shooting abroad. I won't say where, because that shows we were. We go abroad at the end of the season. And uh, we were shooting abroad, and uh, I was like, hey, you, you want to hang out for a couple days? We're, you know, we're going to go jet skiing. He's like, no, I'm off to North Dakota. It's a revolution, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. He was going up to stand, uh, stand on a pipeline or something. Almost the man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was pretty cool, yeah. So, how, so you, how much of the show do you have mapped out before you go into production? Is it the type of show where all the episodes are written, and then you go into shooting them, or are you? Yes, yes. Wow. I, can't, I can't really, yeah. I see it as one big, long film. I see it, you know, it's cut up into last year 10 parts, this year 12 parts. And uh, if you go into that not knowing your ending, I think you're doomed. Um, so we, we, we had a very definitive ending. A couple episodes blew up along the way, and you have to you know, work fast and rewrite them. But uh, yeah, we knew the full narrative arc of the show. How much of the show, I mean, you moved to New York not that long ago when you came here. Did you move here for The, the Daily Show? Was that yes, yeah. Sam got the, uh, Samantha B, my wife, she, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, she, she, I think she deserved more than that. I'm sure. <laughs> Fine. Just trying to I'm, keep them clapping. I'm still beating her by four applause breaks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we moved here in 2003. For, uh, for She got the show first, I got it a year and a half later. Was uh, your moving experience similar to the way that we see it in the show? Yeah, it's, it's chaos. It's, it's, if, you, if you haven't lived here, you know, outside of maybe Tokyo, I can't, Im I can't imagine moving to another city, or maybe London, uh, another city that just sends you into immediate chaos, and you just don't know what you're doing, and you're so lost, and this dumb Canuck couple Coming, coming down with a stupid Canadian moving van and trying to parallel park on a one-way New York street and wedging the truck perpendicular <laughs> along the street and people honking at you and me just saying, I don't, I don't want to, I, I need a tow truck or something. I don't, you can keep honking, but it's not moving. 
I, I am, I do not have the skills to move this. <laughs> the weirdest thing about when you first moved to Nor New York is how quickly you become acclimated to the one or two blocks you live on, and then anything outside of that is maybe kind of scary or dangerous because you don't know it and you're in the big city. Yeah, we were in, we were in, we were in Hell's Kitchen. We were living, we moved to Hell's Kitchen or a Clinton, as they've tried to rebrand it. It's never going to work. Have they tried to do that? They've tried to do it many times. It's, it's not going to work, yeah. I think they've gone back to Hell's Kitchen because it feels cool. It's not. Uh, so we were, in, we were in Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> we were in Hell's Kitchen, and uh, uh, we were visiting a, or uh, uh, we wanted a friend to come over, and he lived on, fi we were on 50th, and he was up on 57th, and he's like, ah, that's a little far. <laughs> It's like it's a seven-minute walk. It's a block. It's a minute a block. Uh, yeah, you don't leave your you don't leave your neighborhood. Yeah. I live on the Upper West Side. I never ever leave. Well, the I, I'm the West same guy now. Wonderful. I mean, I'll never go to Brooklyn. I mean, that's just and, and, and I recognize that Brooklyn's cool and there's lots of awesome stuff over there and phenomenal restaurants. I'm not gonna go. <laughs> You're missing out, man. I'm I live sure, in Brooklyn. I, it's no, the best. That's the thing. I know I'm missing out, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm not going to go to Brooklyn. <laughs> now, I, I imagine a lot of people have asked you this, and I think anybody who's been on a politically-minded comedy show or just politically-minded show that walked away from it after a little while, do you miss being on The Daily Show, specifically right now, as we're faced with a administration that makes headlines literally every fucking minute? I want to go a second. Every second something changes. No, and for that reason, that's why I don't miss it. I don't think you can craft a good joke nowadays because you'll spend a day working on it. I think it, you know, it takes basically a day to come up with the great joke to rebut something stupid said. Uh, and it just, it's old news by the time you get to shoot it. Like it's just, it changes so rapidly now that I, I, do, not, I do not miss it or envy the, the people that are doing it, including my wife. <laughs> I'm like, how was your day? She's like, awful, everything changed. <laughs> It was never, it was, you know, they, they, uh, they. So, well, they're doing weekly as well, which I'd imagine is even, even harder. Yeah, so on Friday, they're on, uh, sorry, they're on, uh, they, they, they were on Mondays, but now they're on Wednesdays. And, uh, sorry, we, I'm the executive producer of the show. <laughs> uh, we're on Wednesdays, and, uh, you know, we'll have the show written Tuesday night, and then Wednesday morning it all changes. It all blows up, and you have to just, like, frantically scribble to come up with a new show. Wow. Yeah. How much do you uh, impart your jokes or your your take on everything as a as a producer? Or how involved are you? I uh, I, I went to, uh, launching the show. I was very involved. Um, I'm sort of getting back into it now that we finished production of the Detour, and I, I, I was really just a sounding board. I would come in. It was honestly the best job ever. It still is the best job ever because I'll go into rehearsal not having seen anything. I'll sit there and go, that could be funnier. <laughs> And everybody hates me for it. Right, with your title, The Asshole? The Asshole, <laughs> yeah. The guy who brings, like, sodas into the, the or beers, mostly. <laughs> Where it's clear this is no beverages in the auditorium. I sit in there, drink a beer, eat some popcorn, and it's like, come on, come on, that's going to be a funnier joke. <laughs> it's the greatest job ever. I'm an armchair quarterback. <laughs> it's the best. And they hate me for it, but they, they sometimes respect me and think, oh, yeah, maybe this could be better. But also, all jokes aside, I, I, I go, I follow the news, and this isn't clear to me. You should maybe, maybe clear that up. The show is, uh, are you still a news junkie? How can you not be right now? <laughs> How can you not be? It is, we're watching a reality show right now in the form of our nation and politics. So how, I don't see how you can't be. The, the people go, what's happening? What Trump said what? <laughs> like, what? How, are you, how can you not pay attention to this? I'm, blo I'm blown away when I have a conversation with someone like, I didn't hear that. Or, really? You're not addicted to Twitter and news feeds all day? How is that possible? He's grabbing what by the pussy? He said what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear about this. <laughs> Um, there, was a, there was a lot of people who thought Sam should have uh, taken over uh, on The Daily Show, but her show has taken off. It's, it's, it's sort of become, for a lot of people, myself included, a, a, a weekly event, of a way for catharsis through the complete bullshit that's happening all week. Were you surprised? Did you have a feeling that it was going to take off, that it was really going to work? Uh, I believed in her because I worked with her for 10 years at the show. I, the, the, the thing that boggles my mind is that she was doing that for 12 years and no one paid attention. <laughs> She, you know, she wasn't. She, she couldn't get a, you know, article written about her to save her life. But now that she's sort of stepped into the foreground part, it's nothing but praise. So I, I go, yeah, of course it was going to take. I've been seeing her do it for 12 years and doing it 
exceptionally well. And now she's just take she's just step, you know, she stepped off the use of basketball. Now she she was six man. Now she's you know leading point guard. And she's a she's a producer or an executive producer on the Detour. Correct. Well. Yes. On what? Is it correct? Yes. Oh, correct. I think yeah. greatness. And I was like, what are we talking about? The show, greatness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what is her involvement on the show? Is she just like a sounding board for you? On Same the thing. Show? Yeah, yeah. If I go too far, you know, which I tend to do, she'll go, ah, yeah, really? You want to fall in that? You want? How, do you, how do you know what's too far on this show? Because I feel like the show... Doesn't go far enough? I feel like it goes extremely far. I love yes, how does. far it goes. Yeah. I mean, we, we push it right up to uh, lawyers telling us, no, you can't do that. Well, what, have okay. they, what have they told you you couldn't okay, do? Okay, so in the next, I don't want to spoil it, but the next episode where there's a home birth, or one of our neighbors has a home birth, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to to show a crowning shot because the ki our kids come in, our kids come in and witness it, so I wanted a sh uh, crowning shot, and they said absolutely not, absolutely not, and I fought them, fought them, and then I went, me and my other producing partner, uh, Brennan Schroff, he, I think he had the idea. He was like, "Fuck it, reverse it. Let's do a POV from the baby." So we, <laughs> we did a reverse crowning shot, uh, and it's so much funnier. Everyone's seen a crowning shot, meh, but, uh, and it's shocking, yes, but to see the, uh, to see, you know, the kids storm in, and you, you see them about to scream, and then we just cut to darkness, and you hear a heartbeat, and it's just <laughs> as the uh, labia is opening. <laughs> And then, and then you see the two screaming teenagers <laughs> looking right at that. It's a much funnier, better shot. And uh, so they forced me into a, a, a funnier position. As someone who's a, who's a news junkie and is like a, a addicted to the news as well, do you have trouble not putting some of that stuff in the show? Because I think there's stuff in the show that you know could be seen, seen as commentary, just in the sense that you're making great jokes about a sort of particularly racial moment. But the show itself is not connected to the uh, specific world that we're living in right now. No, I mean, the, you know, in the, in the first episode, there's the, there's the character who he's the uh, uh, upper west side, upper east side, liberal white guy who's woke and uh, championing <laughs> causes that he shouldn't be uh, caring about as much as he is, and th that's just a, a stereotype that you know we poked fun at it a little bit, because because you know you basically everyone, no matter what color you are, kind of goes shut up, <laughs> get off your soapbox. I'm just I'm just getting a sandwich, cool it, yeah. Uh, do you, do you feel like you when you're writing episodes, is it hard to not sort of inject references to or things uh, stories about what's happening right now? I mean, I'm, uh, I mean, when we wrote, I mean, we wrote last year, so none of this right. was happening. That may find its way into next year. Uh, but yeah, you, I mean, we're, I'm always informed by what's happening, and I never want to make something that's just pablum or you've seen before. So yeah, zeitgeist, for lack of a better word, <laughs> does inform, <laughs> does inform uh, uh, how we write. Let's open it up to the audience for questions. Who has questions? Hey, how are you? I'm good, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Right. So I was wondering if there was any place in New York that you didn't film and you'd like to film, where would you film? And like, in actuality, are you a road trip person? Uh, so where, sorry, where, what was the first question? Where, well, um, I where said, didn't I film where I'd like to film? Yeah, if you'd like to. Uh, to say the truth, I hate filming New York. <laughs> it's a pain in the fucking ass, because New Yorkers hate films. <laughs> they don't stop. It's. It, Nothing looks better on camera than New York City. Like, there's a couple shots I go, oh my God. But it was, just, I just think back of like how many people gave us the finger. <laughs> told us no one is excited to be near a No one. Everyone here. hates it. Hates it. In fact, there was a guy that we were shooting at. We, were shooting, we shot in uh, Harlem and we used a building, a beautiful old pre war building. And this, this guy, this resident, we actually named a character after him because he was such a pain in the ass. Uh, we're like, hey, did that guy have a name? Oh, let's give him that guy's name. And, uh, and he was such a pain in the ass that, that uh, every day he made a deal. I was like, we're not in your way, dude. Like, just go. We're welcome. Like, please go, 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 go. He's like, he just wouldn't stop. He just would not stop. So it's a pain in the ass. Uh, second question, road trips? No, they suck. <laughs> What's the worst thing that you've ever had happen when you're shooting in New York? Uh, oh, uh, well, uh, third day of filming, uh, a man with a knife uh, stabbed a few people. Uh, police came, they shut down the block, shut down our show <laughs> for the day. Um, and insurance didn't cover it. <laughs> so we had to like make it up on the back end. Yeah, they're like, ah, it didn't, doesn't affect you guys, sorry. It wasn't, wasn't a force of nature. <laughs> like it was, he had a knife, he was crazy. Um, so that was fun, that was fun. 
That would to make the, you had to like cut story or like cut scenes. For yeah, we just had to shoot faster. Oh god. <laughs> yeah, and we already shoot these episodes in four days, which is crazy. Like we that's a that's a breakneck speed, especially in this city. But this crew here, this New York crews are so good. Like they are just on their game always, and just uh, so upset at like if, if an AC a camera uh, assistant who's in charge of the focus. They miss a focus mark and and uh, they're so mad at themselves. Not the DP's mad at them, but then also they're mad at themselves for missing a potentially great moment. Next question. Hey, Jason, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Um, so my question for you is: um, before you start shooting episodes, what are some remedies that you do before you actually get on camera? And I saw on the trailer you got hit by the cab. Did you like getting hit by the cab? <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, something called Hollywood magic. <laughs> I didn't get hit by a cab. <laughs> I wish I got hit by a cab. I was planning on getting hit by a cab. A guy who looks a lot like me first got hit by a cab, and he he broke the windshield with his head. <laughs> and they were like, you want to give it a go? I'm like, nope, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Let's just use that one. <laughs> Great shot. Uh, Re a remedy before I start shooting? What's it? Is there anything that you, any traditions or any, uh, you know, lucky charms that you have or do before? No, shooting? I'm not really a superstitious guy. I just kind of, I kind of go, uh, everyone set? All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. When you were, when you were on The Daily Show for a while, you, you were acting to a degree, but you weren't necessarily doing scenes or doing some of the, you know, Re re rehearsing or memorizing a script, were you nervous getting back on set and being sort of a day-to-day -day actor? Like no, that? it's so much easier now because bef on The Daily Show, you are you are acting. I'm not myself. I'm not a that big a douchebag. Uh, <laughs> I am, but not that big. And you're playing a part, but you're acting with a real person. And you're you basically know what they're going to say because based on, on you know, pre-existing interviews, they're going to say a soundbite for you, so you're you're trying to get that soundbite from them and then respond in an, an actual oh, so you conversational have, you way. You have scripted lines essentially waiting Absolute. for those Wait, You think bites. we just made that shit up off the top of our head? I see. I see. <laughs> I'm that good that I fooled you, <laughs> just like I got hit by a cab. <laughs> no, no, it's it's basically the same thing, but much harder because you're working with a real person who, although he may have said said, quote, in another interview, he may not want to say it again. He may not want to phrase it the same way, and you're never allowed to put words in their mouth. Unlike actors, where you go, hey, learn these lines, and uh, I'll say the next line. You know, it's so much easier. I think I have time for one more question. Who You're holding the microphone. Yeah. I'm assuming that's the... I one. guess it's you. <laughs> I no girls. Um, uh, Actually, you, sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> you were talking earlier about being in a position on full front where you're like, ah, oh, that joke could have used something more. Um, you mean the best job in the world? Yes. yes. <laughs> what have you learned uh, about what works and doesn't work about satire in the Trump era? I think we're still trying to figure it out, what works and what doesn't work. You know? I, 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 it's an ongoing changing world that I just, it's, we're all navigating it together, you know, satirists, journalists, uh, human beings, just civilians, and everybody is just trying to navigate what, what does this mean? What does he mean when he tweets this? Oh, it didn't mean anything? Then why did he do it? Like, I just, it's, we're all just trying to figure it out. Uh, for, I, even the supporters, I think, are trying to figure out, I'm like, are you, uh, Mr. President, are you going you gonna to get to the jobs you promised us? <laughs> You know what I mean? That's why I voted for you. The healthcare thing, my premiums tripled. You, you gonna take care of that? Because I got some, I got some bills I can't afford. Um, I think the supporters, in many ways, as much as I would sort of slag them a little bit, I think they're the ones who've actually figured out his his, his Twitter habits in the sense that they're just kind of like, who cares? Let's focus on policy and do all of these things. They're the one people. They're the people who, when they say that, I'm like, I have some disagreements with that, but fair enough. That might be the best way to move forward. Those are apologists. <laughs> I am not <laughs> for the apologists. Necessarily but... supported. There is listen. There's a base that no matter what he does, yes. won't lose. I mean, he said it himself. Like I can strip naked and run down Fifth Avenue, and they'll or show, shoot, shoot a man. Much funnier if he strips down naked. <laughs> 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 yeah, sh <laughs> and shoots him. Much funnier. I strip down naked. I shot a baby, and I'll still win <laughs> the presidency. And he's right. He's right. That's the thing that bugs me. Like, or not bugs me, but it's, it frustrates me. Uh, you, he says something. He's like, yeah, they'll support me always. And they do. He's kind of always right with his, with his base. Yeah, absolutely. He can do no wrong. So. 
Well, Jason, until he um, does. The detour premieres tonight. Is, yes, there, it does. is it a two a two episode premiere tonight? Get this two episode premiere. First episode commercial free. Whoa! We're behaving like a premium channel. <laughs> Jason Jones, everybody, the detour tonight. <laughs> <laughs>